it is already streaming right it says on my thing that okay good okay let's get started so we'll continue our discussion on vertex expansion last lecture we had introduced the concept of vertex expanders as a way to construct these samplers so let's re recall the definition of recall from last time We define the notion of vertex expansion. We set a graph G on N vertices and D regular. This is not needed for the definition, but most graphs that we will be talking about will be D regular for some constant D. They'll be regular graphs. Hmm? D regular is called a Ka vertex expander. For some one less than or equal to K less than or equal to N. K is some positive integer between one and N. And A is a number which is strictly larger than one. If for all sets, yes, of the vertices, subsets of the vertices, if size of S is, is smaller than K, then the neighborhood of S is at least A times the neighborhood of the size of S. So the set of vertices which are distant one from set S is at least, you have a graph G, you have a set S, and then you are looking at ENFS. These are all vertices which have one and uh, at least one. Uh, so NFS, if you recall, the definition of NFS is six, is exactly it's those vertices in V such that there exists a U in S such that U V is an edge. So this was the definition of vertex expansion that we had mentioned last time. And we had said that this is a promising definition to construct samplers. But then we had left the last lecture with three sort of questions. Okay, we defined given such a definition, do such objects exist? They exist, okay, good. Then are they useful? Can we actually construct samplers from them or are they useful for other things? And furthermore, uh, can we actually construct them efficiently? We ask all these three questions. We will answer these three questions one at a time. We'll start off with the very first question. Question one is, do such graphs exist? So any questions on what these are the definition of these graphs? So I follow the definition, uh, but isn't it that these graphs can be disconnected under this definition? These graphs could be disconnected, uh, 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 provided if k, k goes all the way up to n over 2, then they can't be disconnected. Mm, wait a second. If k is going to an okay, let's say k is equal to n by two. So k k say n by ten, it can be disconnected. You can take uh -huh. certainly you can take, for example, you can take two graphs which are uh, n by ten comma a expanders mm -hmm. and put them together. They will continue to be n by ten comma a expanders. Mm -hmm. They will be disconnected graphs. They will be expanders. We will come to this later. That is, up to what point is expansion true? We will see it later on. Right now, the definition allows expansion to up to any uh, any k, mm -hmm. and these graphs need not be connected at this point. The way way this definition says, these graphs need not be connected. Okay. Okay. So, and uh, just a trivial example: take two exp vertex expand k a vertex expanders, just put them to the side by side with it. They are certainly going to be k a vertex expanders. Of course, the k becomes relate the relative size of k becomes half the previous k. 
but k as k the way we have written here is an absolute number that remains the same okay, okay. Hmm. and the first observation you see is actually random graphs you just pick a random a graph at random what do i mean by that so let's fix some cap degree d let's fix degree d to be 3 4 5 something not two two only degree two only uh, two regular graphs are cycles hmm? or union of cycles and these are not good expanders so let's not take two regular but from anything larger than d let's just pick what we'll show is actually a random graph picked uniformly from the set of d regular graphs on n vertices. is expanded. In fact, the theorem is, in fact, it's not just expanding, it's we'll show what we, we will, I'll say the theorem, which actually shows it's extremely expanding. How, suppose you pick a deregular graph, what's the maximum expansion that we can have? What's the maximum factor A that we can have? At most B. Sorry, I didn't catch who. At most D, I think. At most D, that's the, this one. If you are a little careful, you can show that it can't be, uh, it can actually do a slight, it can't be D minus one uh, to D minus one is also uh, it, not just D. You have to be a little careful. I'll ignore that. We'll show that these random graphs are almost D minus one expanders. In fact, there's this theorem says that hmm, for all D greater than or equal to three, hmm, there exists an alpha such that for all n, a random a random deregular graph on n vertices versus is d minus one point zero one. Sorry. Basically, it expands all the way up to d minus one. You pick a random d graph with, with, with probability at least, with with, with, with high probability. High probability. Let's chew the statement a little bit. What it says is you just pick, I want to know if such expander graphs exist. And I just say, pick a random D regular graph, D being anything starting from three. There is a point, there's an alpha at uh, this one. All of these graphs are uh, expanding, and expanding almost up to the um, uh, optimal point of view. They expand all the way up to D minus one. D minus one is not doable, but you can do way up to very close to that point. Like, how do we pick this uh, random deregular graph? I think in the previous course you mentioned, I forgot it. Huh? So, yeah, so this is this proof we want. So, how do we pick it? One, of course, there is a space of uniform distributions. You can uh, pick the random, there's a, the, so the set of all deregular graphs, you pick one at random, but that's not an efficient way to sample. So, I do, in order to avoid this, I, what I will prove in class is actually a weaker theorem for which it's easy to know how to sample from irregular graphs. We'll prove the bipartite version of this theorem. Uh, otherwise, I have to actually define what is the ra random distribution. How do I uh, produce this one from this? It's going to be a delicate matter. So to avoid that complication and to just get the main idea of this theorem across, we will work with a weaker version, which is a bipartite case of this. That's what we will show in the next 10 minutes. We'll prove the, we'll show a weaker version through a weaker 
because there it will be there i'll be able to answer your question precisely i'll be able to tell how to produce a random d regular cross on n vertices a weaker you can do this also but i don't want to get into the details of this this no it is a weaker bipartite version of about you so here what am i talking about i know what's a bipartite expander as before let's assume you have a left side and a right side and let's assume that both sides are equal we might later on be looking at bipartite graphs in which the two sides are not of the same size huh and we are going to talk about expansion only from the left we want to say that for all sets yes so we we, we have the same property we'll say that g equals L R E is a K A left expander if for all S subsets of L mod S less than K implies that N of S is larger than A times size of S. So take any set S here. You look at its neighborhood. This one is at least a times size of this. Um. Uh, in the theorem about uh, is alpha a function of the random, uh, randomly sampled uh, deregular graph, or is it something which holds for any random sample? It's like some constant independent. Yeah, so, so the way it actually will work is the way. So we will see all of this shortly. But this one, but the way it will work over here, the way it will work over here will be that how uh, the alpha is determined by you want we wanted d minus one minus uh, per, d minus one minus point zero one. That's all. Point zero one determined alpha. I want it close. How close I wanted to d minus one that determined the alpha. Oh, so that it holds for all any randomly chosen graph. It's not a function of the sample. It's not the function of the sample. No, no, no. It's not a function. No, no. The sample comes afterwards. The notice the order of quantifiers. There for all d, there exists alpha such so that for all n, the sample hasn't yet been picked up. And now I pick up the sample. Okay. Oh. Okay. And why? Where's the choice of alpha coming in? The choice of alpha is coming in is how how close I want to be to t minus one. You could write it the other way. You could fix the alpha and then. Uh, how close you come to d minus one will be a parameter of alpha. Ah. Okay. Um, uh, as we change the size of s uh, that we are picking, which is smaller than k, uh, does alpha change? I mean, can we ask for larger alpha or smaller alpha with size of s? Sorry, Neha, I didn't catch your question again. Yeah. So uh, I'm asking that. So you said that alpha is a function of uh, point zero one. Uh, it's also a function. It's also a function of t. It's a function of t and point zero one. Okay. Does it also have anything to do with size of S? So what we will see eventually, this we will pay, prove this eventually by the end of lecture, either today's lecture or tomorrow's lecture, we'll see that actually small sets will expand at a much larger factor than larger sets. The expansion factor will be smaller. This one for small sets. When when we come to spectral expansion, all of these questions of yours will become clearer. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So depending on which size sets you want to expand, you can get more expansion, and all of this will be clear. Okay, is is vertex expansion is the bipartite case clear? By the way, bipartite case, uh, you don't even have to go to. You don't even have. You can expect all the way up to d. The the expansion it uh, one. What we will show is the following. We sort of theorem. We will show that. For all d, in this case, not even I'll drop even even the fact that d is greater than or equal to three. Uh, even d equals two will work for us. Hmm? There exists an alpha such that for all n, hmm, a graph sampled from bipartite n d. What is bipartite ND? Bipartite ND is going to be the distribution of. Yeah, I'll define this distribution a little more carefully after I say the theorem of 
graphs which are by the way i should have said one thing i want i'm going to be looking at graphs which are deregular from this side i don't care what's the regularity from the right hand side it's going to be deregular from the left side the side that's expanding that's where i care the of the degree hmm? Hmm? a graph sample from this one is an alpha n d minus 2 left expander probability at least half this half can be boosted up but just i'm just stating it as half okay and before we go let me just say what bipe nd is bipe nd is the following distribution you first how do i pick this graph i pick You decide the left set and the right set so of both of size n. You just choose it arbitrarily, and then for each vertex here, you pick d neighbors uniformly at random with repetition from the right hand side and make those these neighbors. So they might be uh, they might be multi edges between. Y p n d is not a simple graph; it's a multi edge. So each edge. we will just pick at random d vertices from the side and call them its neighbors similarly for this set we'll do it for each one of them there might be a repetition that might happen that's how the graph is picked so this is a bipend this is the distribution bipend so for each v in l pick d vertices in r uniformly at random with repetition and assign them as neighbors of Uh, i have a question sure yeah so in a multi graph uh, suppose one vertex has you know double edging going to one another vertex yeah so when we take the neighbor neighbors of this vertex then it is counted only once right the counted only once it's counted only once. once all right so so suppose, you should have asked that question even in a simple graph if two vertices in the set yes have the same neighbor do you count that neighbor twice no because that's what that's how you had described uh, so ns is just defined as the set here all of which have are the connected from yes by one by uh, making one step so whether it is if you can come to it in multiple ways i don't care it will always count it once in this case. yeah so so once i develop this suppose i find such a random graph a so random multi graph uh, and delete the edges to make it a simple graph you can make it a simple graph the degree will it, you there are two ways to make it a simple graph one answering way neha's question is how small is d compared to n so typically i'm going to think the application the proof i'm going to give you is not is going to work with any d but the applications which you'll be thinking of are d d being a constant d being like 4 5 10 or something much much smaller than n so almost surely this thing will actually be a with very high probability the graph you obtain will be a simple graph there won't be any multi edges that you pick up mm. yeah okay so then you can actually find a, a simple d regular graph with this yeah graph. you can find a simple d regular graph this experiment will be with very high probability okay notice also suppose you manage to show this for multi graph how to get a simple graph then just take the multi edges and just reassign them to elsewhere the expansion is only going to increase further it's not going to decrease mm -hmm. so even if you got a multi graph that way you could just reassign the edges so you can always get a simple graph at the end of this experiment right neha that does answer your question too so d we think of something like very small is something like 5 or 10 or something even as small as 3 possibly and in fact the bipartite case possibly not 2 because d minus 2 doesn't make any sense but anything beyond after that
Okay. So that's the reason, the reason I'm working with a bipartite case is this distribution is easier to describe in the bipartite case in the, uh, in the, uh, the non-bipartite setting. It's hard, I, it's hard to describe a distribution that's going to pick up irregular graphs. That's going to be difficult. We can do it, but I spend a lot of time doing that and I don't want to do that. So I work with this distribution instead because here I'm ensuring only regularity from the left side and not regularity from the right side. It's only D left regular. Okay. So is the statement of the theorem clear now with now that the distribution has been specified explicitly? Any questions on this? Okay. Okay. So now let's go and plunge into the proof of this. So Let k be let k be some number less than or equal to alpha n and and s a subset of the left side such that mod s equals k and yes typically yes no, s is not going to be this one let k be this one what we'll ask the first we'll first try to understand the probability of p k which is probability over the choice of g picked from by nd that there exists a set yes here yeah, so that modus is exactly k huh? and neighborhood of s is smaller than d minus 2 times k that is it doesn't expand okay let's first understand this of pk then of course we'll have to add p1 plus p2 plus p3 all the way up to p alpha m that will be the total probability, the probability that there's an error. You're going to ask what's the, so how do we, how do we, how are we going to show this? We're going to show this, I should have mentioned this beforehand, by the probabilistic method. We're going to just pick a random graph and show that the probability that it fails to be an expander is very, very small. In fact, we'll show that the probability, we pick a graph from this distribution and ask what's the probability that it fails to be a, It fails to be a distribution. It fails to be expander will be small. So what's the probability that it fails to be a distribution? That there must exist some set S of some size k less than alpha n such that the neighborhood of S is only of size strictly smaller than d minus 2 times k. Okay. So in fact, we will try to do this. We will expand this further. We'll write this as a probability of pks is the probability. G, we'll fix a particular thing. We'll ask what's the probability. So S is S is that is this that this event happens where S is some subset of size k of the left hand side. So notice that PK is exactly less than or equal to. Uh, summation pks as the union bond will tell you this uh, over all s in l choose k l choose k is just a notation for all k size subsets of l uh, so now let's look at this we, i want to understand this event that n of s is less than d minus 2 times k. Once again, we have this, we have fixed a particular set yes of size k. And I want to know what's the probability that its neighborhood is of size smaller than d minus 2 times k. Now, what's the, uh, what, what, what's the distribution of its neighborhood? It's just kd independent points picked in the right hand side with repetition. That's the exact, the distribution of the right hand side is exactly KD in independent vertices picked from the right hand side. That's exactly the distribution of the neighborhood of S. Hmm? So let's, and, and well, e, in each time you pick, you're going to pick a vertex out there. Let's find out what, what's the probability that there's a repeat. What's the, what's the probability? So, so the neighbors of S are 
random vertices v1, v2, vkd. Picked. Okay. Using the uniform Uniformly at random from R. These are the neighbors of this one. There might be overlap on them. The point is, is this really a, what we want to ask is this is, I have written it as the sequence of vertices. There will be overlap. Sometimes I might pick the same vertex. In fact, that's the reason why. If there's no overlap, you expect this set to be of size KD. What I'm asking you is the set is of size uh, k into d minus 2. There are at least 2k repetitions along this. That is, there are at least 2k repetitions. That's the event I'm looking for. So let's ask what's the probability that the ith vertex is a repeat? That's a repeat of the previous vertices. That is, the ith vertex has already picked up. Now, up to i, how many vertices have you picked up? You have picked uh, at most i minus 1 vertices. There could have been repeats even among them. Therefore, the ith vertex being a repeat is exactly the probability is less than i minus 1 by n. Do you agree? And this is always less than kd by n. For the way we are setting up, i is always this. So the probability that any vertex is a repeat is always less than the probability kd by n. A repeat is just the fact that that vertex has all a, a copy of that vertex has already been picked up earlier. Now I want to claim the probability that n s is less than d minus two k is the probability that there are at least two k repeats. If they are not over two, two k repeats, you are, there are more than d minus two k vertices, uh, vertices on the right hand side, distinct vertices, and then the set, the set expands. So this is exactly there are at least two k repeats. But this is a quantity which I can now write down. This one, what is this? This is firstly I'm picking up. I can choose which are the repeats, hmm? and each of them has to be a repeat. So it's at least so much. It could be even larger than. This. Sorry, it could be it could be it could be smaller than this. It could be, it's, this is an upper bound on. I pick, I pick a repeat. I pick two k repeats, and then I choose this guy. These are the one. Now, what was p k? P k was summation. This was this was p k. This was this was the Experiment PKS. PK was certainly less than or equal to summation S in L choose K. PKS, which is which is e, which is equal to how many uh, this ones are there over here? So N choose K into KD choose two K into KD by N whole power two K. Okay. People with me so far. Now I'm just going to apply the binomial expansion that n choose r is less than or equal to n e. The, I'm just going to use this upper bound for binomial. n choose r is less than or equal to n e by r, the whole power r. Hmm. I want to put an upper bound. So this is n e by k, the whole power k. This is k d by 2 k the whole power 2k. This is kd by n, the whole power 2k. Okay. So let's write everything as some power of k. People are confused or is it okay? You mean e, no? Kd e. What? Sorry, there is a e over here too. Okay. So firstly, let's do but this k and this k can get cancelled. So, if so, what's the the numerator? The numerator I'm going to have an n. I'm going to have a e square e cube. 
you guys need to check if I'm doing this correctly. And how, what's a K? Then there's a K square and a D power four. I'm just collecting numerator. Denominator, there is a K, there is a four, and there's an N square. So this is E cube K D power four by four N. Okay. Now we haven't yet said what up to what size sets expand. I can set that K is K, K is always less than alpha N. We know this. So I could set this to be uh, th this is E cube alpha d power four by four k. So what we'll just set is we'll set alpha to be equal to one by E cube d power four. Therefore, this will be less than or equal. This will be e equal to one fourth to the power k. All of this was just alpha. Alpha was up to what factor? What alpha was this quantity? Up to what point I wanted to expand? So now, what's the probability that if I pick a g, g is not a d minus two? Sorry, g is not a alpha n d minus two left expander. This is certainly less than or equal to P1 plus P2 all the way up to P alpha n, which is like one fourth to the power one plus one fourth to the power two, one fourth to the power alpha n. I'm just going to take it all the way. Certainly, this is a number less than half. Less than half. Therefore, Therefore, G is uh, alpha N D minus two left expander with probability at least a half. It's a simple calculation, uh, this one. It's just to show that the numbers work in a pair. You pick a random graph, it is going to be an expand. The calculations you can look at it this one. This is the same. Uh, I've uh, taken the same calculations as in Salim's notes, but let's more stare at the theorem. So that's the theorem statement we want to show that you pick a random graph like this, it's an expander. Okay. Any questions on this statement? Now we'll see what we can do with such a graph. Um, so we, uh, when we say that it's alpha n d minus two expander, which means that we can choose sets of size uh, less than equal to alpha n, right? Yes, yes. That's oh. why that's why I I I've summed over P one, P two, all the way up to P alpha n over here. Because oh, okay, okay, fine. Oh, I missed this. Yeah, question. So, I was so, my question was about that only. Thanks. Huh? My question was about that part itself. I yeah, missed so the part. P k is that there's a set of size k that doesn't expand. We want all sets of up to size k. Therefore, I'm adding them one after another. All right. Thanks. Questions. So, yeah. can you say how to get a simple graph? Uh, can you get a simple graph out of this bipartite graph or something? What do you mean a simple graph? You know, I suppose I just want a simple D regular graph. Uh, not a bipartite graph. You not know. necessarily a bipartite. No, no, no. There you have to do a the distribute. This is not the distribution I'm going to be sampling from there. What we will say. So the way to actually to answer Ishan's question, how do I pick a D regular graph? This one, we will pick a random matching. Let's assume D is even firstly. I'll say this for even D. Let's pick a random, we can pick a random matching of the vertices. Huh? Mm -hmm. Or let's assume, sorry, not D is even. Let's assume N is even. N is, yeah. N is even. Let's pick a random matching of the vertices. We'll pick D such random matchings and then say the, uh, the yeah. sort of the 
combination of all of them is our d regular graph so strictly speaking i had to pick d by 2 of them because uh, this one but you will be careful about this if you careful about this you can do this that's how you picked and then you have to do the same analysis for that it's a little the distribution is a little more painful and that's why i didn't do it the, the bip nd is you it's uniform uh, with without with repetition therefore it's a very clean even this involves some uh, binomial coefficient that's going to be even uglier that's why i didn't do it but you can do it for exactly that distribution you can run the same experiment and be done okay i was wondering for, for, like every graph gives you a bipartite graph right Out of it, you can just naturally construct a bipartite graph. If the original original graph had two n vertices, then you have. You're just taking a double cover of a. You're just yes, taking yes, two yes, yes, vertices yes. and making them into cop two copies of each other and putting yes. the edges. This one. Yeah, and yeah. if you fold that guy sort of, then you get. No, no, no. So not. So that's a. So you're showing every graph is a bipartite graph, but not every bipartite graph arises from a graph. So it's unclear. That's whether... right. So there is an automorphism condition that you need. For the bipartite graph to give to to have arisen from yeah, but that's a very very small uh, size subset in this one. So we need to show that you need to pick up something like that. So eventually, we are not going to use this. This thing was only to convince us that such graphs exist. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we are not going to use this random process at all. Whole the whole point of using expanders was to reduce randomness. Mm -hmm. We can't be spending randomness to build the expander graph. We are going to be doing something else. No, I get it. I get the point, but I mean, this just a separate uh, curiosity. No, you could do. You could try to do that. You could try to make a, a regular graph out of this by showing that uh, the number of double uh, number of bipartite graphs which correspond to this. You can show that this is with probability at least uh, this. Uh, the density of uh, by uh, double covers in the set of bipartite graphs is large enough so that even So by the way, this one half is just this one. I could have said this. I could have said this number to be one by hundred to the power k or whatever I wanted. I just it's a different choice of alpha. So I could make this this half to be as small as I want. Yeah, yeah, and you can then try out these things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Questions. Okay, we have such a graph. So, so it answers our first question. We have such a so such graphs do exist. Uh, in fact, pick one at random; they exist. And the next question, given this, what I ask is: Are such graphs useful? And can I construct such graphs deterministically without using randomness? Without using randomness, and we'll answer the first question useful. But I want to first ask: What does it mean? Can the answer can we construct? Such graphs. I'm not going to say deterministically. I'm going to say explicitly. What is ex? And I'm going to be loose about this word explicitly. First, we're not going to answer this question now. But I'm going to ask: What does it mean explicitly? Of course, you could say we've shown this of this. Just now, go over each by vertex, each graph and. Uh, set of all irregular, uh, and you check if one of them is irregular. You can pick it up. That's one way of explicitly picking up a construction. But I don't want it. I want this process to be an efficient process. This process runs in time uh, polynomial in the number of graphs, which is too expensive for me. What I would want is so there's various notion of explicitness you can give. Firstly, we don't want a single graph. We want a family of graphs. I tell you n, you must give me a graph on n vertices. So we'll so the what is Explicit constructions mean explicit constructions are these. We will fix a particular d. D will be some constant. So fix a d, and we expect to construct a family of expanders. Say in particular alpha m, and say some e expander. Expanders so G n, n going from one to infinity. That is for each where the vertex set of G n is of size n. So I want a family of graphs. It's not sufficient to pick one graph. You want to pick one graph. You can brute force it. That's a constant time. That's not what I care for. We asking. If you want to talk about 
how fast you can do it and all we need to talk about family of graphs and the family of graphs it picks a d d is some constant like 10 100 3 5 and then you are asking what's the complexity of constructing a graph of size n of with this property now certainly we know that i can construct such a graph in time which is polynomial in exponential in n because i can then just go over each of the graphs and find out which of them is an expander and do it but i don't want to do it what we want is we will ask two requirements of it an explicit construction is given n outputs gn in time polynomial in n that's what we mean by one notion of explicit construction sometimes i'll want an even more explicit construction which i will call a super explicit construction now it won't be clear why actually I care for such a super explicit construction. So what I want, so notice you can't, you can ask, you can't do ever better than polynomial n because you have to output the graph. You have to basically, what does it mean output the graph? You have to output the adjacency matrix of the graph. That's the representation of the graph. And that requires time, which is poly, poly in n, linear in n. There's no way you can expect something better than explicit construction if you want to output the entire graph. But we say, I suppose I don't want to output the entire graph. So, so suppose given n, huh? and I want to output the graph implicitly, and a vertex b in n, and a i in d output the ith neighbor of v in g n. So this notice now I don't have to output the entire graph for you. So I, this restriction that the algorithm has to run in poly n is sort of thrown out because I just need to output what is the neighbor of the ith neighbor of v in the graph. And if I can do this in time, poly in all the input sizes, what are the input size? It's log n and log d. Log n is the log n is the amount to specify to specify this and this. I had to specify n that will take log n bits. To specify a vertex, I had to specify which vertex, the first vertex, second vertex, the nth vertex, that's another log n bits. And I need to specify i, that's log d. So if I can do this, then I will call the construction super explicit. Notice that this super explicit construction, this algorithm which outputs this, doesn't even have time to write down the whole graph. But yet, given a vertex and i, it must be able to tell the ith neighbor of the vertex in time, this one. So the running time of the algorithm, the algorithm the, that's what I mean by super explicit. The graph is so succinctly described by such an efficient algorithm. The graph might be a humongous number of vertices, but there's a compact algorithm that can describe it. And a priori, it won't be unclear why do we ever want this, but we'll immediately see in the next, uh, that's going to be our next application where we'll see that if we had a super explicit construction of the vertex expander, that will be a very useful object. Is this clear what I mean? These are, diff by the way, these are very different from the random construction. The random construction takes time exponential in n. Now I'm asking, can I do something better than that? The first step better is something which I can do in poly n. That is, I construct a graph in poly n. The random construction also already does not do that for us. We'll see later on that we can actually construct such graphs. We'll actually see not only can we construct in poly n, we can actually construct, give a super explicit construction of the expanders in the sense that given n and so you give me n, that means I'm talking about the nth vertex, nth graph with the list of graphs. In that graph, now I tell you a vertex label V and then I tell you a edge label going out of that vertex. Now tell me what is that uh, the other vertex I obtain when I uh, leave out of this edge from this vertex. Can you tell me the name of that vertex? So this is a, so it's a sort of a very, very compact representation of the graph. And says that can be done in time poly log n log d. Notice that this polynomial time I'm giving this algorithm, it doesn't even have time to write down the list of vertices. So it can't write down. It has it's it's extremely restricted. But yet I want to say so we bet we will see that we have ex expander constructions which are super explicit in this in this sense.
So if you haven't seen the definition of explicit and super explicit, it's wise to just understand what this means because this is important for us for the rest of the uh, rest of the lecture series in the expander lecture series. That is this notion of what explicit means, super explicit means. At this point, it won't be clear why we care for super explicit. But super explicit is something even better than explicit. The moment we see the next application in the next ten, fifteen minutes or so, you, you, I hope you'll be able to appreciate why we care about super explicit constructions over explicit constructions. Questions? Have I lost people or people with me so far? i think i follow okay yes no don't care will be useful okay so we're going to go to the next question question 2 which we asked are expand are expanders useful this is last question from last time and what we'll see we'll see a particular application towards reducing randomness if super explicit construction of expanders exist okay that's going to be the next so just for now let's recall Let's quickly recall RP. Uh, remember that not our friend, but lang probably plus language L is an RP if there exists a randomized polytime algorithm A such that the following happens: if X is an L, then probability for the random choice of R A X R is accept. Is greater than or equal to half, and if X is not an L, then probability over R A X R is accept is zero because there's a definition of R P we had, and then we saw how to reduce um, error reduction. We already saw this. One way of red uh, reducing R P F F on any input X. You don't run it just on one particular choice of random points. You run it on k independent random points. So R one, R two, R k, A x one. So run A x R one, A x R two, all the way up to A x R k, and then accept if any one of them accept. Because you know, in the no case, you will always reject. Therefore, if even any one of them accept, you know this. So what we saw this is k independent repetitions. independent repetitions hmm, they reduce error from half to 2 power minus k that is even if one of them accept you are going to accept so what's the probability that all of them you are in the s case but all of them fail to accept you have to you have to have, have happen to be lucky unlucky with all the k random Choices. Each one of them, you are unlucky with probability half. You have to be unlucky with all of them. That one over two to the k. This this is something we saw all the time. But this came at a price of this came by choosing k independent uh, uh, r ris. Therefore, total number of random points that the algorithm uses is. K times m. M was the original number of random points. It used k times m, and the number of repetitions the algorithm makes is all is k. Hmm? So in general, if you want to reduce 
So reduce error from half to delta in number of random coins needed is m times log one over delta and number of repetitions of the algorithm is log one over delta. And what we are going to, the question we are going to ask is, we are going to uh, yeah, do use expanders to reduce the number of random points. One second, I'm going to sit down. So you recall this problem that we had, the setup. So what I'm going to run, so we're going to do, so, so suppose so this was the space, this was 0, 1 to the n. Previously, I drawn it as a rectangle, but now it's 0, 1 to the n. This is 0, 1 to the m. This is the space of all random, space of random points. Let's assume we have an expander on this set. So this is what we, this is what I'm going to call n. Suppose we have a k a rather let's say not k a let's in fact say all the way an n by two a expander an expander expander graph expander which is d regular for some constant d greater than or equal to 3 and a greater than 1. These are two fixed constants. They are not going with n. Suppose we had this and furthermore, we also had an explicit, a super explicit such construction. I'm going to say, I'm going to show off an error reduction algorithm, which is going to do something slightly different from what we had before. We are not going to pick the vertices. We're going to not pick the T, the K random points independently, but we're going to pick the following. So look at the following algorithm AT. So on input X, X is some input in the zero one to the N. As usual, you pick, you pick the first coin R, random from uniformly at random from 0, 1 to the end. But then, so you pick the first point R, but then after that, you need to pick R1, R2, RK. What we do is we'll not pick R1, R2, RK. We will just walk in this graph of, of length T. So we will now let R1, R2, RK be all so R, you can view it as, so view R, so we are going to view R, R as a vertex in the graph G. So we're going to pick up, I'm going to, so let's, let me say it at this point. So before I do this, now uh, con construct G N, N being equal to 2 power N, super explicit. Suppose we had this construction. Now think of R as a vertex in GN. Now let R1, R2, RK be the set of all vertices in 
within distance t of r that is r1 r2 rk is exactly what we call the ball of radius r comma t that is it's a set of r primes in the vertex set of gn such that the distance between r and r prime is less than or equal to t hmm? run a on xr1 all the way up to xrk and accept if n1 accept and reject all those so is the algorithm clear what's happening let's look at the algorithm once again so this is the graph go back to so so picking this was the graph g which is on the graph is i'm super imposing it on the set of random points the, the set of vertices of the random points and the graph vertices of the graph i'm sort of uh, having a map identifying them with each other you pick a random uh, this one and then look at a ball around it and you run the algorithm on not just this particular random point but all the all the vertices you use this random point as a vertex in the uh, graph and not not just run it on this particular vertex but on all vertices within a t neighborhood of this vertex is that clear so notice i have now used no extra randomness in this thing the only randomness used so let's look at the number of random points used by this algorithm is exactly m there has been no extra thing unlike the previous case that you actually if you did it k independent times you multiplied m uh, it was k by multiplied by m this was this one let's also look at the number of repetitions number of repetitions it's the number of it's the size of the ball how large can the ball be roughly d power t you're going each time is stepping up by d this one so this is some it's a d part t let's keep it as d part t for now clear but what i want to ask is what's the probability of error what's what's the probability of error what's the probability of that at errors this is what we want to calculate at is this algorithm is the algorithm at clear is basically run the original algorithm not just on the one random point but on the ball so at is just run a on on the ball rt for a random r that's the, that's a short for what a is all my description is just to say that is the so questions questions please ask me questions is the description of algorithm clear so the main difference over here is in the previous independent this one we were picking the r1 r2 rk independently each time we are pumping fresh randomness to pick up after r1 we pick pump fresh randomness to pick r2 so if fresh fresh randomness pick r3 and so on here i am not doing any random once i have picked r which is the say the first random point say r1 r2 r3 rk are just all the neighbors or all the uh, random points which are within a t step neighborhood of this particular vertex r that's all i'm doing so we are not pumping any more randomness the number of randomness pick is just the amount of randomness used to pick one ra initial random point and then we are picking this uh, cloud of vertices that are the ball of vertices around centered around r of radius t sorry so how t looks like is this a constant or something like that yeah, yeah. small so, t we will analyze what t what's the t which we want to pick up so t you want to you want to reduce the error so t will be a large enough thing how large t should be we will see that right now we will see when once we do the error analysis notice that t can't be more than because of this restriction 
just as you observed, we cannot set to be p has to be order log n. Otherwise, the algorithm will become super polynomial. P is a constant. If you want, if a t needs to run in poly time, if a t uh, uh, runs in poly time. Okay. So this is one restriction from t. t can't be more than super logarithmic. t has to be order log n. Only then will this, this is algorithm a t be poly time. Otherwise, a t will become super polynomial. So t is some number which runs in, t is, has to be some number which is less than order log n. How large can it be? We will see shortly. Clear so far? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Okay. So now let's go back to ask this question. What does a t earn? So once again, let's look at this. So let's does AT err on a so we had AT error. Can it err on? So it's going. We are going to ask its probability the AT errs on an input in the language and an input not in the language. Can it ever input on a? Can ever can it ever err on an input not in the language? No, it's an RP, so it does not. RP. So uh, for things not in the language, it's always going to reject. Therefore, it's going to this one. So the only case we look at is let's fix some x in L. And let's call bad to be those R's in 0, 1 to the M such that AXR causes you to reject. What do we know? We know the size of bad over 2 power M is less than half. That's the guarantee that's given to us. So bad is some subset of vertices of this type. Bad is some vertex. Okay. Now, what's the probability that AT errs? That AT of X comma R is not equal to accept. This is over the random choice of R. What is the probability? The probability is you firstly have to pick R to be in the bad set because if R had been outside, that would have caused an accepting. Not only that, the entire ball, the entire ball BRT should be contained in bad. This is exactly the probability over R that let's call this bad X because it depends on X. So the probability of this is exactly that BRT is a subset of bad X. Okay. This is what we want to calculate. Now let just like bad bad x was this. Let's calculate bad t of x is set of r's. This is exactly okay. Let's let's just leave it. So this is what I uh, bad. Okay, I, I define it anyway. So bad x of t is the set of R's for which this happens. These are the bad centers for the algorithm AT. So just to notice, bad X are the ran bad random coins for the algorithm A. Bad XT are the random uh, uh, bad random coins for the algorithm AT. And I, what I want to ask is how small is the probability? This is basically what we want to ask. So we. This is we, we are interested in calculating this particular quantity, which is the same as this quantity, which is the same as bad x t by 2 power n. Right? So uh, like, Prala, the equality refers to the one above, right? Yeah, equality refers to the one above. So let's say this is the error from error. I want to say error is equal to this. Hmm? So now I want to look at bad XT from two different viewpoints. This one. So how do I want to write this? So no, notice, so let's look at this graph again. So 
just redraw the graph over here just for picture. We had the set pad. Hmm? Notice that this is, I'm going to drop the subscript text because I'm working with a fixed a fix text. Hmm? So the set pad X certainly is a smaller, pad T is certainly a smaller size subset of this because the centers have to be in pad T. But not only this, if I draw balls of radius T around them, they should all be contained in pad X. So in particular, if I the entire ball, if I draw a ball of neighborhood, so in particular, this, uh, the ball of neighborhood around bad X, T, neighborhood T should be contained in bad X. Do you see that? That's basically, that's a, in fact, this is a definition of bad X T. This is how I defined it. The, the, the entire neighborhood. Hmm. But what do we know? This set, firstly, bad T, bad. so we know that bad T to start off with is a set of size is, is less than half the vertices because bad itself is less than half the vertices. Therefore, if you take one step, you will certainly expand by a factor larger than, you will expand by a factor A. Now, if you take two steps, you will expand by a factor A square. If you take three steps, you will expand by a factor A cube. And each of these, and up to T steps, you are always contained in bad. So each time you are going to be expanding by a factor, uh, this one. So what I want to claim is bad T, the set of bad T is greater than or equal to A power T into the set of, sorry, what I want to say, bad, bad X, the size of bad X is certainly greater than the size of the ball of bad X T of radius T. And this is certainly greater than or equal to A power T times the size of bad, bad X. Because bad X was, uh, ba sorry, bad X. Bad X T. Bad X, bad X. Hmm? Because bad X T is a size, is a size, size less than half. Therefore, its neighborhood, because its vertex expansion tells you its neighborhood is larger by factor A. But not only its neighborhood, its next neighborhood is also larger uh, by another factor A. And you can take T steps and you still remain completely in bad. Each time you satisfy the vertex expansion condition. And so the neighborhoods are, the neighborhoods are constantly increasing by a factor of A, but yet they are not become too large. Notice a bad T is a set such that even if you expand, even if you take T steps, it still remains in bad. Therefore, how small can bad T be in terms of, this will tell you that bad X T, bad X T has to be less than bad by a size A to T. It has to, because even if you, each time you're growing by a factor A, and you still remain in a set of size, just half the set of vertices and expansion is guaranteed. So each time you're going to grow by this, this will tell you that the error of the algorithm, which we had written was bad X T by two power M is less than bad two power M by A power T. Therefore it's the origin. This is certainly less than half into two power A T. And just, I'm just going to drop the half and just call it one bar eight. The also the, notice the error of the algorithm has dropped down to one over a part t. Therefore, the error has dropped from half to one over a to the t. Now, if you set setting t to log one over delta by log a, we get the four. We get that the error drop, the error drops, this is becomes delta. So in fact, if you look at the theorem, which we have proven, we have proven the following theorem. Let G be, G V E is a D regular, graph on n vertices mm -hmm. 
and is a k a and is a sorry not k a an n by 2 a expander n by 2 a expander for some a greater than 1 then for all sets b contained in the vertex set such that mod b is less than uh, n by 2 the probability when you pick a random vertex that b or t is contained in b fully this is less than or equal to 1 by a power t the entire ball is contained in this bad set that's the probability we wanted what we wanted was the entire what's the probability that if you pick this is the our bad event was the probability that if you pick a ball you not just pick a vertex but if you pick a ball the entire ball is in the bad set that goes down a bad factor of 1 by a power t so this is a theorem which i want to So going back to our error reduction thing, error reduction from half to delta. So number of random coins that we used. Notice is just m. We didn't use any additional random coins. What's the number of repetitions? The number of repetitions is d to the power t. this if you look at it this is poly 1 over 10 since since d a r constants and e and uh, delta is equal to 1 over 8 so let's compare this so prala just uh, to clear the notations uh, yeah so bad is the is the is the set of all coins which will make us err on this fixed input x right yes 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 and this set it should define bad x t is the set of all coins such that even when you take a t size ball around it you still lie in bad in uh, yeah yeah Uh, yeah. Okay, and then uh, okay, and that's how we are trying to bound the probability of that. So bad is exactly the probability that you bad bad is the set of rand bad points for this particular input x. With respect to the random algorithm A. With respect to the algorithm A. What is bad bad x t? It is those centers for which not only the center is in it, but the entire ball itself is in in the bad set. Right. Hmm? And the claim is. because the graph is so expanding it cannot be constrained to be in such a set of size half most the, the if you pick a thing and if you take steps like this there is a step step invariably you are going to get out of this bad set that's what's happening it's a expander graph therefore moment you begin taking vertices the question is are you going to be constrained in this bad set for the entire t neighborhood and the claim is no you are going to you're, because the graph is expanding there are links to the outside thing it's just going to be escape and what's the probability that it will remain completely in it it is exactly this so that's exactly your question i'm not yes. sure if I, i'm just restating whatever you said yeah it's clear okay. so others also if you just let's i wanted to do something else but we can pause and just stare at this and ask questions about this for the next few minutes. yeah so so that i understand what's going on uh, let me try to do the following suppose i first choose a vertex a uniformly at random and then at do then do a t step random walk so the another randomness mm -hmm. so so since this is an expander this should mix very fast so this should visit we have proved this we haven't yet proved this we yeah yeah but yeah. 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 just for so so since this mixes very fast it should uh, philosophically get outside this bad set so so that's basically what this is going i mean you're not using random walk you're taking a ball which is a ball which which does not need that extra randomness Mm -hmm. But uh, is that as in that's the kind of thing? Is is that what is going on? It's a weaker property in that. That's a strong. We'll actually prove that. That's called this. By the way, this result is due to. I should say this result is due to Carr. 
This is due to carp, pepinger, and sipsir. This is called the KPS generator. What you are talking is taking a random walk and asking that the random walk will leave the set. You take mm -hmm. a random walk and leave the set. We can show that also. That's a stronger property than this. This is just stating. Uh, so there are two. So what's Abhishek? There are two things being asked here. One, one is you pick a random vertex, take a walk of length t, and see if the walk, all the vertices in the walk, leave the thing. Here I'm not just taking a walk of length t. I'm taking every possible walk of length t and asking if any of them leave the set. This one, because I'm taking every possible. I don't need to invest any further randomness in the construction which we give. But Abhishek's construction, we will have to use. We'll have to use the original randomness plus t log d because you have to pick a neighbor each time. Hmm. This is a, we will analyze this random walk more carefully. It's a it's actually a better the construction than this. I want to say that just this this is what we prune is a slightly weaker result than what you are asking for. So it will certainly be a consequence of what you are stating. That so it will take a little more work, and we'll prove this in a lecture or two from now. All right, thank you. But what I want to say, what I want to say is exactly what uh, Ishan is stating. What what is it stating? You have. Basically, it's just the following property. I have given a graph G here. Hmm? Then, and which is a vertex. G is equal to VE. This is, a, say, a KA expander. Hmm? Now, I choose there is some bad set here. Hmm? And I want to ask what's the probability that I fall into the bad set? Certainly, this is exactly the density of the set. It's bad over 2 power n. Now I want to ask, what is the probability? Not only I fall, but a whole ball of radius, a, a ball of radius t also falls into the bad set. Now, because it's an expander, the fact that a ball will fall into a set, by the way, this set need not be contiguous in any way. It could be spread all over this one. The probability that the bad, that the entire ball will fall in the bad set goes exponentially down, uh, decays exponentially with the size of the uh, ball uh, with the with the radius of the ball. If the ball is of radius t, the probability that the entire ball will be in the bad set is going to go down exponentially in t, which is sorry, which is exponentially t, where t is the radius of the ball. Is that clear? And this is because it's an expander. Notice if if it's not an expander, I won't be able to prove this because there might be times you'll be stuck in the bad set like anything. It could be a graph. It could be so happen that the graph is all the the uh, the, if it were not an expander, it could be the case that all the vertices, uh, all the vertices over here, all are connected to other vertices over here, and you never leave this set. So even if you take the whole cloud, whole ball of radius t, it will still fall within this. But because it's an expander, it just keeps it takes the steps, it, it keeps on expanding. The probability that if we know that this, so we, we are asking, what's the probability? If the probability of falling in this set is of size at most half. You're asking what's the probability that a whole ball falls in this set that decays exponentially in the radius of the ball. That's all we are trying to say. It's just the simple fact. I gave a long this one for it, but this is all that's happening over here. And that's just because of this one, because of expansion. The key, uh, key step going on over here is this particular fact. Because of expansion, we have this. The ball of bad bad xt grows by a factor a each time, and it's growing by a factor a for all the t steps, because all the t steps are within this bad set. If any one of them had already gone the bad set, then this is no longer this one. We are asking what's the probability the entire thing is that. So each time you are growing by a factor a, and you have so you have to grow by a factor at least a part t. Therefore, this original centers, the bad centers of the ball should be smaller than the size of bad by at least a factor of 1 over a part. By the way, you should stare at this proof. It's a fairly simple proof. It's just, I said it in a very wordy fashion and stuff. It's a very fairly simple proof. But once you realize vertex expansion, it's an immediate outcome of vertex expansion. Okay. Yeah. I have a question in one of the steps that, uh, in the proof. Okay. Uh, this is error. Uh, do you have something written error equal to something in the proof above? Yeah, just stop here. Uh, yeah. So uh, the last inequality, uh, do we know that bad size of bad over 2 to the m is less than or equal to 1 half? Or? This is because this is just because bad was the original set of 
pad was this set of coins. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, so it comes in. Uh-huh. Fine. Uh, that's why the RP construction came. The pad was the original set of random coins, pad random coins for the given input X. All right. Uh, and I was wondering that, uh, so uh, is it increasing the uh, number of, rep- it's probably increasing the number of repetition that we need now, right? As compared to the case when we were picking uniform strings for each run of the algorithm. Yes, yes. And now if we, uh, instead of choosing uh, this R1 uniformly at random, if we choose uh, this R1 to be of something, I don't know, lesser entropy than log M, uh, that, will that lead in some sort of trade-off between the amount of randomness and the computational complexity in some sense? Yeah, so right now, the methods which we see right now, till we will start, we, we will never, so we are only talking, we, are, we can ask these questions, whether we can pick even random points less than M, that is mm-hmm. running one independent, this one. The things which I will talk in the expander section, we will not talk about this at all. But when we come to the latter sections, the PRG construction, pseudo random generators, the next module in the course, we will actually talk about that is, we are not, we don't want, so the point is, if this was an arbitrary set B that you want to fall in, this is the best you can do. You can't do anything better than this. But the point is, B is determined by this bad set, is determined by an algorithm. Right. And we will use this later on to show that actually we can reduce the number of randomness. This will be part of what we will do later on in the course. Mm-hmm. So do people look at like characterization of a uh, sort of the ran- amount of randomness versus the number of repetitions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, this okay. is the important thing. This is, yeah, this is, this is exactly what, right? It's just that I don't want to write it down because there's a whole bunch of, there's, a, there's a error reduction, there's number of repetition, there's random points, there's, it's a big table. You can, they will be, mm-hmm. if you look at a bunch of papers on extractors and all, they'll have tables trying to impress you with this. It's confusing if you don't know what the parameters are, so I don't want to talk about it. But this is what, there's a whole industry of such results, which is trying to trade off one parameter for the other. All right, yeah. Thanks. Just to add a little bit to what Neha was suggesting. So the point is, okay, let's for the moment assume that we are only going to work in settings where the ball that you're going to look at is only polynomial size. Because you're interested in algorithms that eventually run in polynomial time. So you don't want to invest more than that much time. Uh, sorry, that much time in this. But if you, uh, like if, if, the, if the initial choice of the, the first point, if that you are going to use far fewer randomness, then notice that there are vertices that you will never explore. Because for every setting of those randomness, you're only going to explore some polynomially many vertices around that. So if you want to at least look at all the randomness, then it feels like the randomness for the initial set needs to be large enough. I don't know if I'm making sense here. I mean, like the... Uh, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, but but what Pralad was saying is about this, this is like saying that, okay, suppose you used only, instead of M bits of randomness, you use only M by two bits of randomness. What does that mean? It means that the initial n- number of choices for the first vertex is at most two power M by two. And okay, I am exploring a polynomially large ball around it. So the total number of vertices I might ever look in this algorithm is 2 power m by 2 times poly. But I can somehow say that all the bad set is completely contained in the, you know, just this is my bad set. And uh, I have no way of escaping this. Okay, so that's the reason why, I mean, like you might, I mean, but of course you can sort of say that my graph is such a, like what sort of stupid randomized algorithm has this as my bad set. Okay, so maybe the fact that the bad sets come from an algorithm may give you more power. And uh, in those situations, you can actually even, you might even be able to save on the first M bits of randomness. But as stated right now, it doesn't seem like you can. Yeah, once it is uh, further expanded was this one. Notice how was bad defined? Bad was the set of bad coins for this particular algorithm. Hmm? But when I stated the theorem, I didn't say what bad is. I said for any B. Now, if you want to do it for any B, what Ram Prasad is stating is you cannot do better. You have to, if you are, if you want to do it for any B, then you have to pick at least one uh, random point, uh, one one point purely at random, the center at random. You, you cannot escape from that. So M bits of randomness, you will have to invest. But the point is we have not used the fact that this B 
later on in the course we'll use that this b is not any b but it's a b that arises out of a polynomial time algorithm and we can exploit that later on but if you want to do any b what ampersand say applies and you can if you show me as if you pick uh, even with lesser uh, randomness in which in the first step itself you don't pick up then i can choose a b such that it's this condition is blatantly violated mm -hmm. okay. yeah uh, also over here this was for a specific x uh, we will have to say it for every x like for every, every x will have a different bad set yeah yeah but the algorithm is but the way the theorem is stated this is true for every b yeah the way i stated it for true for every b that's the whole point it is it doesn't depend the expander thing for any b for no matter which b you pick up this property is true and we needed it to show it for every x in the language so in particular it's true for every bad x mm -hmm. thanks yeah any other questions so there was a question about the cycle cycles are not expander graph cycles you can show cycles if you take a path on a cycle they expand just by the two end points they the cycles are very bad expanders okay i wanted to say one more thing about it where did the super explicitness of this construction come in why did we need the graph to be super explicit the expander to be super explicit in the repetitions right pardon in the repetition right so out here when i pick this the question is how how much time do i get the question is where 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 do i need the description of the graph i need to construct given r i need to find out this this step huh the point is an explicit this an explicit description of the graph won't suffice i cannot afford to write down the graph if i write down the graph the graph is on size 2 power m vertices i can't afford to write it down i must just be able to do this give me a vertex i must be able to find out its first neighbor second neighbor third neighbor dth neighbor then once again for each of those vertices find its first neighbor second neighbor third neighbor dth neighbor you must be able to find that out in time polynomial in their input lengths i cannot afford to write down the whole graph so even an explicit construction of the expander wouldn't have sufficed what we do need is a super explicit construction of expanders only then will this proof go through otherwise this step is not an efficient step technically speaking step 2 also ha huh? what is step 2 i mean step 2 is construct g explicitly i yeah, mean like it's unclear that, what that means what that, yeah. that is yeah. just uh, there is nothing that that's, that's just a uh, uh, you are not using it for anything the actual step is this step this step is where the whole thing is happening Whether it, I should not have put construct. I should have just said, let G, let G N be a super explicit construction. You have it. You haven't yet run it at this point of time. So the actual where you where you are using the super efficiency comes in this step. And this is where we need the super explicit expanders. And what we will see surprisingly, they do exist. Super explicit construction of expanders. Sorry, I didn't get that super explicit part. Like, uh, why? Like, how, why do we need them there? Like in that step. So why do we, we just want? Them? Yeah. So you have a vertex R. You need to be able to compute its neighborhood. You need to be able to. This step. This step requires you to find out all the neighbors of R, all their neighbors, their yes. neighbors for t steps. You need to be yes. able to compute this. This algorithm needs to do this efficiently. One way to do this efficiently is you have the adjacency matrix representation of the graph. and then write it down but this is notice that the graph is on 2 power m vertices this is not efficient in any sense of the word okay. i need to run in time which is poly into poly in log of 2 power m right got it yeah so this place is exactly where we need this up, this step is is this let me actually let me highlight that this step is poly time because of super explicit construction otherwise it is not
otherwise it defeats the whole purpose of this if you're going to write down if you're going to write down the entire graph then you might go over all possible random coins and decide which random coin is a good random coin or a bad random coin. because the moment you find a good random coin you know how to whether to accept because it is an rp algorithm so this explicitness is important for us in this construction the super explicitness not just just explicitness won't suffice we need super explicitness and surprisingly we will show that we can actually construct graphs which are expanders we'll be able to give explicit constructions then we'll be also be able to give super explicit constructions so what we'll do in the next lecture is we'll take a diff we'll take a different take on vertex on expander graphs so vertex expansion so what i'll just spend 2 minutes and we'll find up for the day so what we want to do is we want to now construct such graphs do that explicit construction what i want to say is given a graph how do i certify it's a vertex expander hmm? now notice that to certify that a graph is an expander i have to go over all sets yes and check all sets of size at most k whether this property is true now if k is like n by 2 or n by 100 this is an exponential many this one to certify a vertex a graph is a vertex expander is not an easy property so what we'll see is ask is there an other property of a graph suppose graph has some analytic property if it satisfies some analytic property that certifies this statement and this is what we'll go and we'll enter into what's called spectral expansion and this will be the focus of next lecture okay what are the questions um, no no somewhere in the middle i have just mentioned that it's useful to think of non expanding graphs and see where this theorem may fail like for instance if you take something like a cycle or a hypercube what are examples of bad sets where the chance of a ball lying inside seems to be Pretty substantial. So yeah, that was that was where the cycle came up. Uh, By the way, what are non-expanding graphs? Any graph basically that you can draw nicely on a paper is non-expanding. But almost every graph is an expander. So most graphs that you can draw well are actually not the graphs which you draw nicely on a piece of paper are all. They are going to have us basically. If you can draw a graph well, you they will be. You can just if you can draw a graph nicely. i'm just i'm giving a completely informal statement here if you can draw a graph well you can there will be a small set of vertices which you can cut off from the rest of the graph and this set of vertices will not be expanding at all you can show these properties so in very big expander are going to be those graphs which you will not be able to draw nicely on a piece of paper they won't have nice pictorial descriptions of them so most graphs that you draw on a piece of paper will actually be non expanding but on the other hand most graphs are actually expanding we already proved that theorem at least with the bipartite case any other question i'll stop with this so we proved two things today we showed that random graphs at least in the bipartite case are expander graphs that's this theorem we proved this and then we showed that if you expander graphs if you then we talked about the notion of explicit constructions and super explicit constructions and emphasize what's the difference between them what we care about will be not just explicit constructions of expander graphs but super explicit constructions of expander graphs and i sort of tried to impress you on why we require super explicit by giving one application we showed that of this of uh, this carp pipinger sipsa theorem which says that hmm, suppose you you're given an expander graph and you're given a bad set of size which is less than half the number of vertices now ask what's the probability that not just a, a random vertex falls in this bad set but an entire ball of radius t falls in this bad set and the carp pippin just observe whatever we just showed shows that this probability decays exponentially in the radius of the ball therefore the larger the ball you take this probability is going to be smaller and smaller and smaller okay. and that was useful for randomness reduction in rp error reduction that's an aside point but the main thing is this carp pippin just observe that's what we did today i'll stop with this and we'll enter into spectral expansion next time next time will be okay i'll stop the stream yeah